Welcome to the John Gets Games tutorial for Clash of Cultures Monumental Edition. In this video, I'll be teaching you the rules to the game as it's being played, and I will be showing about half of a two-player game today. Now, I do want to ask that if you enjoy this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support the channel and the creation of videos just like this one in the future, then please go to johngetsgames.com support. There you'll find a bunch of ways that you can really help things out, and some of them come with perks, like watching some videos early and advertisement-free, as well as voting on which of those videos are made. The last thing I'd like to ask is that if any part of this game really jumps out to you, or if you see a turn that we really should have done differently, then please comment down below because I love to see that kind of feedback. All right, let's now jump into the game. Out here, the game is set up for our two players, and before I start, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles, because I might make mistakes as I'm showing the game to you, and those will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them. I will also put corrections below this video in the top comment. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of the game. This is a civilization-style game where each player is in charge of a specific civilization, and then we have a map out here which is going to vary in size depending on the overall player count. Now, the ultimate goal for each of us is to get as many points as possible, and we are going to get those by establishing new cities on the board and growing those cities. We will also get points for advancing our civilization, gaining a variety of benefits. In addition to those, there are other ways to get points, but those are the two main focuses. Now, as we play through the game, we are going to be expanding out and exploring new regions, which we will flip over. We are also going to be putting military units down onto the board, which we can then use to fight our opponents, as well as the neutral barbarians that are invariably going to start showing up and making our lives difficult. As far as the overall game structure is concerned, we are going to play through up to 18 rounds, and within each round, each player has to take three actions. After we finish three rounds, there will be a status phase where a variety of things happens before we move on to the next column where we once again perform three more rounds. As I said, on your turn you take exactly three actions, and there are six different action options that you can choose from. Now I will go into the details of how all of those actions work as well as everything else that you're seeing here while we are playing the game. I do want to point out that we are going to play through 18 rounds or the game will end after a set of three rounds where any one player is fully removed from the board. The final thing I want to mention in this overview is today I am filming with and going to be explaining all of the details for Clash of Cultures, the Monumental Edition. This edition has the original Clash of Cultures plus the Civilization expansion mixed into it to make this new edition, and all aspects of the game and expansion have been updated and improved for this edition. With this in mind, each player is going to take on a specific culture and can bring out leaders. We also have access to all of these pieces over here, which involves new military units as well as three new buildings, and there is also a new wonder in the mix. In addition to that, the barbarians also get access to these new military units, and there are some pirates that might show up in the water areas to make our lives harder. Once again, I will explain the details of how all of this works while we are playing, and on that note, I think let's now start the game. Now, we are going to be the starting player because we have this token in front of us, and with that in mind, we can now start the first round. As I briefly mentioned in the overview, the game does come with this round tracker, and we are now in the first round of this set of three rounds before we move into a status phase. Now, I do want to mention that there is an alternate round tracker on the back which uses a variable end game variant, and I'll explain the details of how that works later on. So, we're starting the first round of the game, and within each of these, the player with the starting player token will take their full turn, and then all other players will take a turn going clockwise around the table. Once that's happened, we will then move on to the next round, so that means we can now take the first turn of the first round of the game. The structure of a player's turn is that we must now take exactly three actions, and there are six different actions to choose from. Now, the game comes with this great player aid, and it's double-sided. This is for use with just the base game, and then you can use this side if you decide to use the extra expansion content that comes in with the Monumental Edition. We are playing with that stuff, so we can use this side, but it's worth noting there is no difference to the six main actions in the game, whether or not you're playing with the expansion or without. For our first action, I think let's advance. Now what this means is we are going to add a cube down to this area and then gain the advance shown, which means as a civilization, we are going to become stronger with new options and abilities. In this case, I think we want to advance into the arts, and whenever you advance, you have to spend two of your food, and you can substitute that for ideas as well as gold. Gold is a universal wild resource, so you could spend that for anything else, whereas ideas can only be spent while advancing. So if we had two ideas right here, we could spend those to advance. If we had it like this and that, we could spend one food and one idea to get to that two cost for the advancement action. Of course, we start with no ideas, but we do have two food, and let's now spend the two food in order to advance once. As I said, I think I want to advance into arts, and the way we do this is we take a cube from our event track at the top, 
It doesn't matter which one it is. And then we place it down onto the advancement that we want. Now, as a general rule, whenever you place a new cube down into one of these sections, the first cube must go on the top. After that, you can then advance it to anything that is below it. So, for example, we could have advanced into roads right now because we started with mining. That is the top one, which means all three below it are currently available. Once again, though, we're going to go with the arts. And if at this moment we had no cubes left over here on our event track, we would then draw and perform one event and then take three of our cubes and place them back over here. So essentially, every three times we advance as a civilization, we're going to draw an event and then deal with the consequences of it. Of course, that's not the case right now. So the next thing that happens is we are going to gain a bonus. You may have noticed that some of these advanced spots have no color. Some have a yellow border and some have a blue border. And whenever you advance into a blue border area, you gain one culture. And whenever you advance into a yellow border area, you take one mood token. In this case, we went for blue which means we can take one culture and place that in front of us. Now, culture can be used to construct monuments as well as to try and influence our opponent's cities, and I'll explain how both of those work later on in the tutorial. Next up, let's focus in and learn a little bit more about the arts advancement we just gained. The first thing that you'll notice is it says obelisk with that arrow icon next to it. Whenever you see that arrow icon, that means the thing it's associated with has to do with the expansion content that is added into Clash of Cultures Monumental Edition. In this case, since we have arts, that means for the rest of the game, we have unlocked the ability to construct obelisks, and if you weren't playing with the expansion, you would simply ignore that part with the arrow next to it. After that, you'll notice underneath arts, it says 1x free action. That means one time per overall turn, we can, as a free action, perform what it says. It says we can pay one culture, which we do happen to have, to take an influence culture action. Now, you can actually take an influence culture action as one of your three main actions on your turn, and I'll explain how that works later on. As you can see, though, this lets us spend this to do that without spending one of those three actions, effectively letting us gain an extra action within that turn. Now, at this point, you may be wondering why we actually went for the arts. It's giving us something that I'm not explaining, and it has unlocked a building that we're probably not going to be constructing just yet. Well, the reason for that is because today we are playing as the Maya civilization, and whenever we advance on our main board, we also have the possibility of advancing on our civilization board. Now, this is only used when playing with the expansion content. As you can see, as the Maya, we have this advanced board with four possible advancements, and we also have these three leader cards, which I'll talk about later on in the tutorial. Let's now focus on the Maya advancements, because as you can see, next to each of them, it shows a standard advancement action. Now, the main advancement board is identical for all of the players, but obviously this is going to be different. And as soon as you advance the matching advancement on the main board, you also place a cube on that spot on this civilization board. In this case, you'll notice that Stella's requires arts, and we just advanced arts, so that means we can take one of our cubes from the supply, not from the event track, and then place it into Stella's. So by advancing arts, we've put two of these cubes down, and in addition to the benefits of arts, we will gain these benefits here. This says, for the rest of the game, we will gain one culture or one idea when constructing an obelisk, which of course we did just unlock, when founding a city, or when capturing a city. Now, we are very likely going to be founding a city soon, not on this specific turn, but definitely in the first three turns. And I wanted to get Stella's going so that when we found that city, we will gain the extra benefit of a culture or an idea. So that's finished up this advanced action. And looking to the future, if we advance into irrigation on the main board, that will unlock terracing. If we advance into circus sports on the main board, we will get ball courts. And finally, if we advance into astronomy, we will also gain the calendar advance. Well, we're done taking one of our three mandatory actions, and I think for the second action, let's move. The way this works is we can now move with up to three of our groups of units out on the map. At the moment, we start with a single settler here in our starting city, so we have just one group of units that could move. And when you move, you simply go onto an adjacent spot. It's worth noting if we happen to have a couple of units over here, then we could move them together, or we could move one of them into one spot and one into another. And that would actually count as two different groups moving out of our overall maximum of three. Obviously, we just have this one right now. And when we move, we could go onto a revealed land spot, or we could go onto an unrevealed tile. And I think that's what we're going to do. Let's go over here. And whenever you go onto a spot that's unrevealed, you are immediately going to explore that tile. The way that works is we simply reveal the tile, and then we have to place this so that it matches the orientation. That means it could go like this or like that. And the first thing that we have to check is by putting this down, are we placing this land unit into the water? If we put this like that, then yes, the settler would be going onto water, and that is not legal. So that means we are not allowed to place this like this, so we have to spin it around. 
since there are only two options and we know this one is not legal, that is going to be the way we have to explore. Now, it's worth noting there are other rules for exploration when you don't have a situation where the explorer lands on water. And let's talk about those briefly here. Let's say for the purpose of example that this was the tile we had drawn instead. Obviously, this location would be land like this and land like that, so either one would be an option. And the next thing that we would check is by placing this down, can we add water on the new tile so that it is adjacent to water on a previous tile? For example, if this was water right over here and we drew this, then we would place it like that because you have to connect up water if that's a possibility. Now, in this case, that's not even revealed, so that means this would be legal and that would be legal. And the next thing to check if you can't add water to water is by orienting this tile. Can you put water onto the border of the overall map? In this case, that's on the border and that is on the border, but if one wasn't, then we'd be forced to orient this so that water was on the border. If finally you have a situation like this where that and that both have it on the border, then us as the active player can decide which way we'd want it. Obviously, that's not the case, though. This is how we just explored with our settler. Now, it's worth noting that you can also explore with military units, and that works the exact same way as with the settler, and you can also explore with ships, and that works a little bit different, and I'll explain how that works later on once we actually see some ships out here on the board. Well, at this moment, we are done moving, because while we can activate up to three of our groups, we only had one group to activate. The last thing I would like to say before we move on, though, is at this point, if we had recruited one of these military units, we would not actually be able to move them. There is a specific advance which allows you to move military units, so that means you can recruit these at the start of the game as defensive forces, but if you want to go on the move, you have to advance into it. That uses the tactics advance, and I'll explain the details of that later on, as well as the details of recruiting units into cities. With the move action done, we have one more action to take, and technically we could take another move action. If we did that, we would activate up to three of our groups again, and with that in mind, I'd now like to talk about the difference between the forest and mountain terrain. If you ever move a unit into a mountain terrain on the board, then you cannot move it again, even with a future move action within that specific overall turn, and remember the turn consists of three different actions. Now, if you move into a forest area, you can move later on in that turn, but you are never allowed to go into a battle for the rest of that turn. So that means by going into the forest, you're going to be passive with that unit until the end of that specific turn. Whenever you have units enter spots with enemy units, that will cause a battle, and I'll explain the details of how battle works later on in the tutorial. So if we wanted to, we could definitely move. The settler could go onto that space or that space and explore this tile, but I think instead of doing that, let's actually activate one of our cities. At the start of the game, we have one city on the map, and when you activate a city, you can either recruit units into it, you can collect resources in that city, or you could construct a building. Now, for this turn, we are going to be collecting resources, and I'll explain how recruiting and constructing works later on. The way we gather resources is we start by figuring out the size of the city. Now, the size of a city is going to be the number of plastic pieces in it. This is the starting settlement for that city, so that's a 1. And if we happen to have an obelisk attached to it, which we could potentially build because of our advance, then that would be a size 2 city because there are two pieces of plastic. As you can see, up to four buildings can be constructed around these using the activate a city and construct action. And if there were four around, then that would be a size 5 city, and that's the biggest a city can get. In this case, though, it's just a size 1. And then the size of the city will determine how many resources we gather. We are going to get a number equal to the size, but if the city happens to be happy, then we will gain one more resource. Now, cities can be happy or neutral, or they could be angry. And if a city is angry, then it will collect one resource no matter how large the city is. And if it's neutral, it'll collect resources up to its size. Again, our starting city is happy though, so that means we get plus one, so we can gather two resources. Now, when we gather, we can take from adjacent regions to the city or the region where that city is, but the region that we gather from must not have any enemy units on it or any city of any player's color. That means if we had a city right over here, then we would not be able to collect from this forest area with the city because there's already another city there. So let's now collect two resources, and the type of resources we get will depend on the region that we collect from. The plains will make food, the mountains will make stone, and the forests will make wood. Now it is worth noting that if you have water adjacent to the city that you are collecting from, you cannot get anything from the water unless you have the fishing advancement, in which case you can collect food from that water. Likewise, if you have barrens adjacent to your city where you are collecting, you will gain nothing from that unless you have the irrigation advancement, which once again lets you collect food from the barrens. So that means the barrens and the water could get you food, whereas you can harvest food from the plains at the start of the game. The last thing I should mention is if there is an exhausted land tile on a spot, then you cannot harvest from that location for the rest of the game, and these get placed down from various events that happen throughout the game. 
I suppose I should also mention that there are other advances over here that give new collect options. For example, if you have a port next to a city that's going into water, then instead of collecting food, then you can actually collect one of the wild gold resource or a mood token. You can't even build ports until you gain the fishing advance over here. So anyway, let's focus back over here and now collect our two resources. Now we actually have quite a few options. We could take two ore. We could also take two wood instead. And one of those resources could be a food plus one of these others. In this case, I think let's collect a food from the plains and an ore from the mountains. Looking back at our player board, we can track those resources up on the top. As you can see, we have five of these tokens for the five different things that we can gain. The food will go here and the ore will go there. And it's worth noting that we cannot actually hold more than two food until we gain the storage advancement. So that means at the very start of the game, when we had two food, if we had tried to collect food, we would not be able to store any of it because we'd be right up against that limit. That means if we want to collect more food, we are going to want to advance into storing at some point soon, but we can keep that in mind as we continue to play. It's also worth noting that there is a hard cap of 7. If you gain more than that, then the excess is lost. Before we move on, I do want to point out that as the Maya, we actually have a special starting tile, and we can see that image printed on our advanced board. That matches this one right here, and on the back side of it, it says Maya. Now, the standard tiles look like this. They are double-sided, and this is what our opponent has up at the top. So, as you can see, part of the advantage of playing as the Maya is we don't have any barons clogging up our starting space. We have a couple of mountains, which means we could potentially make ore faster than our opponents can. It's also worth pointing out that the new civilizations don't always have their own. Again, our opponent does not have a special tile associated with their starting location. Well, we've now finished our Activate a City action where we collected resources, and we have now taken three actions, which means our turn is done. Now, before we move on, I do want to mention that you can activate cities multiple times. In fact, you can perform all six of the actions as many times as you want, with the possible exception of cultural influence, which again, I will explain later on. The reason I'm mentioning this is because if you activate a city multiple times within the same overall turn, that will affect that city's happiness. If for our second action, instead of exploring, we had activated the city, and then for our third action, we had activated the city again, then that second activation of the city would lower the mood by one. That means it would go from happy down to neutral, and of course, if you activate a neutral city again, it would go down to angry. So technically, for our entire turn, we could have activated this city three times, once with it happy, once with it neutral, and once with it angry. And once a city is angry, you can only activate it once per turn from that point on until you're able to increase the happiness of that city, which I'll explain later. Obviously, that's not the case, though. We have a happy initial settlement, and with our three actions done, our turn has come to a close. So play can move clockwise over to our yellow opponent, and they are playing as the Celts today. After thinking through their options, they're going to start by advancing just like we did, but they are going to advance into irrigation. That is, of course, going to cost them two food because that's always the cost. Again, you could spend gold as a wild resource instead of food if you wanted, and you can also spend ideas for this, but they didn't have any ideas. Now they are going to take irrigation by placing this over here, and since that has a yellow border, they are going to take one mood token from the supply. Now when you take these and put it near you, it doesn't matter which side is facing you, it is simply a mood token that you can then use for various effects in the future. Since the Celts just advanced into irrigation, we can see that their cities can now collect food from barren spaces for the rest of the game, and they also ignore famine events. Now, the famine event could come up from the event deck, and of course, if that happens to the Celts, then they are now prepared for it. That's one action done, and for their second action, they're going to activate this city and then collect resources. It's happy, and it's a size one, so that means they get to collect two resources, and they're going to collect a food from these plains and a food from the barons because they now have this irrigation advance. That means they will gain two food, and they now have one action left. For their third action, they're going to advance again, spending the two food that they just collected. Now, they've decided to advance into writing. That has a blue border so they can gain one culture, and then after that, we can see that for the rest of the game, they've unlocked the ability to build these academies into their cities. Once again, I will describe activating cities to construct buildings, hopefully pretty soon. Now, in addition to that, they immediately are going to draw one action card and one objective card from those associated decks. As you can see, the game comes with four different decks of cards, and it's worth noting that shuffled within the event and objective decks, we have various cards associated with the expansion. So that means there will be less cards in these if you do not play with the expansion. Now, at the start of the game, all players drew exactly one action card and one objective. These are the two that we have in front of us, and our opponent now gets to draw a new action card and objective and add those into their hand. Don't worry, I will describe what these action cards and objectives do for us later on in the tutorial. Yellow is done with their three actions, which means their turn is done, and since everyone has taken a turn within this round, it's now time to move into the next round of the game. 
we can show that by sliding this down, and then we are the first player, so we get to go again. It's worth noting that the first player token can move, but that's only going to happen during the status phases, which will happen between every third round of the game, and I'll describe how the status phases work once we reach the first one. All right, we can now take our first action, and for it, I think let's found a new city. The way this works is we can turn a settler on the board into a new city, as long as the settler's location meets a few different criteria. The first is that location must be land, it cannot be water. After that, it cannot be barren. In addition to that, the location cannot have a city in it already, and there cannot be any enemy units there, which would be other players or potentially barbarians. Lastly, you cannot found a city on a location that has one of these exhausted land tokens on it. Now, fortunately for us, this location meets all of those criteria, so that means we can remove this settler and then place a new settlement onto the board. Now, it is worth noting that players have a maximum of seven settlement tokens, so if all of those are out, you cannot found another city. All right, we now have two cities on the map, and you'll notice that when you found a new city, it starts at the neutral mood, so it is not happy or angry. Normally, that would finish the founding action, but remember, as the Maya, we have advanced into Stellas. That says we will gain one culture or one idea every time we construct an obelisk, found a city, or capture a city, and we did just found a city. So we can take the idea or the culture. Ideas are certainly nice because they allow us to advance quicker, but I think we are going to take a culture. Now, the reason we are doing that is because you need to spend five culture in order to build a monument. And the reason we want to build monuments is because of the objective card that we drew at the start of the game. As you can see, these objectives have a top and a bottom, and if you meet either of those criteria at the specified time, you will complete this and gain two points for the end of the game. Now, the top usually has to do with civilization advancement and peaceful endeavors, while the bottom option usually has to do with combat. With that in mind, if we take a closer look at this objective that we have, the top option is called Wonderful. It says we could claim this immediately if on our turn we are the only player to have constructed a wonder, or during the status phase, if we were the only one to construct a wonder in that age, we would also complete the top objective. Ages are those clusters of three rounds, so even if you get this later on in the game, it is still definitely something that you can work towards completing. Now again, there are two options on here, and the bottom says outposts. During the status phase, if we have armies on at least three different land spaces that are not adjacent to our cities or in any one of our cities, we would complete this. Now again, we can complete the top or the bottom, and either way, we would get two points at the end of the game. So I figure it's probably easier to push to be the first player to construct a wonder to immediately gain these two points versus placing our troops out, but we can obviously keep that in mind. And again, we need a bunch of culture in order to build those wonders, which is why I decided to take the culture. Now I haven't described how we actually construct those wonders yet, and don't worry, I'll cover that later on in the tutorial. Well, that's finished our first action, and for the second one, I think let's go ahead and activate this city to collect resources again. It's happy and it's a size one, so we will gain two resources, and let's once again take a food. That's going to bring us up to our maximum, because again, we can't go beyond two food until we advance into storage. For the other resource, I think let's now take a wood, so that we have one wood and one ore currently available to us. After that, we have one action left, and I think let's spend our two food in order to advance again. One thing I would like to do soon is construct new buildings into our cities. Now the cost for that is a food, an ore, and a wood, which we did have until we spent the food, but right now the only building that we can actually construct is an obelisk. Remember, you get to unlock building these based off of the advancements that we have, and arts let us do that. But at the moment, I don't think an obelisk is what we want to construct into our cities. Each one of these buildings has different effects that are printed on the cheat sheet, and for the obelisk, that specific building becomes immune to the influence culture action that opponents could perform against it. Now, I've mentioned influencing culture several times already, but I think I'm still going to put off describing that. Now, essentially, the obelisk gives us defense against something that I don't think we really need to defend against with our current position, so let's unlock one of the other buildings that will give us more of an advantage in the early game. One thing that sticks out to me is the fact that our new city is next to water. Now, we could build a port on this spot as long as it touches water, and in order to build a port, we need fishing. The port will make a collect resource action even better than just taking food from that spot, so I think let's go ahead and advance into fishing. We've already paid the food, so we can now place this cube right over here, and that has a yellow border, which means we can gain one mood token from the supply. After that, we can see that fishing has unlocked the ability for us to construct ports for the rest of the game, and our cities can now collect food from one sea space. All right, that's finished our turn. This means the Celts can go. For their first action, they want to move. That means they can move up to three of their groups, but they have just one, and they're going to move this settler right over here. So this can be revealed. It doesn't have any water on it, so they can put it like this or like that, and they've decided to go just like that. 
Now, if they wanted to, they could found a city right here. But remember, if you have cities next to each other, they cannot harvest from those spots. Because of that, they've actually decided to move for a second time this turn. And with that, they're going to go onto this spot here. So that means this tile can be flipped over. It does have some water on it. But of course, the settler is going onto this spot here. So no matter which way they put this, the settler could go there. So that means that this is an option or that's an option. If this could connect to other water, they would be forced to do that. But they've decided they're going to leave it just like this. The reason they're going for that is because now there are two mountains next to this city right here. So in the future, they want to set it up to be able to collect multiple ore from that one city when they activate it. Of course, the settler is right over there. And then for their third and final action for the turn, they're going to activate the city to collect resources. And they are once again going to take two food. This time they have three different spots they could actually take that food from. So they will go up to two, and that's finished a pretty quick turn for them. Everyone has taken a turn, so we can move into the third round of the game's first age. Once again, we get to go first, and we do have two cities now in our area. Now, we can spend an action to activate either of these, and of course we could activate both of them if we wanted. We only have the happiness penalty when we activate the same city multiple times within a turn. On our previous turn, we specifically advanced into fishing so that we could build a port over here, and I think we still want to push towards that. In order to build any of the buildings, we have to spend an ore, a wood, and a food, and we currently don't have any food. So I think for our first action, let's activate this city to collect, and just like we've seen before, we can collect it twice. We certainly want a food to be able to construct that building, so we will take a food, and then our other option is going to be wood or an ore. I think we'll take the ore, and now we have two more actions for our turn. For the next action, let's do something new, and that is increase happiness. The way this works is we can spend our mood tokens from our supply in order to increase the happiness of one of our cities out here. It's worth noting this is not a city activation, it is a different type of action. Now the cost to increase the mood of a city is going to be mood tokens equal to the size of that city. Our new city is a size 1, so we could spend our 1 mood token in order to improve the mood of this city from neutral up to happy. It's worth noting that for one action, you can improve the mood of that city multiple times. So if this city had been angry, then we could have spent one of our moods to make this neutral, and then another one to make it happy. Now, as the cities get bigger, it's obviously going to be more costly to increase the mood, because again, you have to spend these tokens from your supply equal to the size of that city. That's why I wanted to do this now, before we increase the size of the city. And speaking of that, we now have one action left, and let's build a port into this city right here. The way we do that is we have to activate the city, and then the option that we choose is constructing a new building. As I've mentioned before, the cost for every building in the game is going to be one food, one wood, and one ore, and then you can only construct buildings that you have unlocked with your advancements. Because of that, we can build a port or an obelisk, and obviously we want to construct a port. Now ports are a little bit special. They must be built into a city where they can place this port down so that it is going into a sea space. What that means is we cannot build a port into this city because right now there is no sea space to go to. There might be one from either of these spots once we explore them, but for the moment there isn't. So that means the only spot we could put this is right over here, and we can dangle it over just like that to show the port is now connected to this sea space here. After constructing the port, we can now look to our cheat sheet to see the effect of that building. In this case, we once again obviously needed the fishing advancement, and then it says when we do a recruit action in that city, we can build ships there, so that's something we could not do before. Obviously, I haven't talked about recruit yet, but I will get to that soon. The next effect says that a city with a port can collect one gold from a single adjacent sea space instead of gaining one food. Remember, the fishing advancement lets us collect food from a sea space that's adjacent to that activated city. So that means when we collect resources with this city in the future, instead of potentially taking a food here, we could take a mood token or a wild gold resource. And obviously, both of those are pretty nice to have around. Now, before we move on, I would like to talk about two restrictions when it comes to constructing buildings into our cities. The first is that no city can ever have more than one of any building type. So that means we could not build another port over here, even if one of these spots ended up being a sea location. Also, we've unlocked that obelisk. So that means, of course, we can't build two obelisks into any one of our cities. And this is certainly an incentivizer to advance into other things to give us a variety of buildings so that we can construct them. Now, the other big restriction is that a city's size can never be larger than the number of cities a player 
our hats. Now what that means is at the start of the game when we had just one city, we were not actually allowed to construct a building into that city because that would make it a size 2, and in order to have a size 2 city, we have to have at least two cities on the board. Now that we have two cities, that means each of these could go up to a size 2, but obviously we could not build an obelisk into this city at the moment because that would make it a size 3, and we would need three cities on the map in order to support a size 3 city. Well, that's finished up our turn, and now the Celt player can go. The first thing they've decided to do is advance, and they're going to spend two food, and it looks like they've decided they would like to get storage going. So they can remove this cube from the event track and then place that right over here. That has a yellow border, so they will gain one of these mood tokens. And then if we focus over here, we can see that for the rest of the game, their food limit has gone from 2 up to 7. So just like the rest of the resources, they can hold up to 7, and they likely did that because they foresee some large collections in the future. Now, at this point, they just removed the last cube from this event track, so that means before anything else happens, the Celt player needs to perform an event. The way this works is they simply draw the top card from this event deck, they then read it aloud and perform everything that it says. The first thing to note about events is in the top left corner, sometimes there are event icons. If there is, then you perform that before you do anything else on the card, and in this case, the event has a Barbarian's spawn icon. So, it's now time to spawn Barbarians out on the map. Now there are two steps to a Barbarian spawn event, and the first one has the active player taking a Barbarian settlement, and they place it down onto a land space on the board that is exactly two land spaces away from one of their cities, and at least two spaces away from the rest of their cities. If that's not possible, they have to place this down adjacent to one of their cities, and in any case, the space must be at least two spaces away from all other players' cities. Now at this point, this could be placed here or there because each of those are exactly two spaces away from one of their cities. In fact, they could place it here or on that spot as well. Of course, that's not a land space, so that's not a legal option. Now, in this case, they've decided to place the Barbarian Settlement right over here. And then the second step of a Barbarian Spawn action involves taking a Barbarian Infantry into a Barbarian City of the player's choice. Obviously, at the moment, there is only one Barbarian City out here, but if there were multiple, including some way on the other side of the map, the Celt player could have placed this infantry down over there. Now, these Barbarians are going to make life hard for us, and obviously, if they could have spawned this infantry closer to us, they would have, but it is going to go over here. Now, when you're playing the game with expansion content, that will unlock the cavalry as well as the elephant units that the Barbarians can use. The way these come out is if a player spawns a unit into a barbarian city that has at least one infantry in it, then that player could, instead of bringing out another infantry, bring out a cavalry or one of these elephants and place it into that city. Now, I'll explain the difference between these units when we talk about combat later on in the tutorial. Well, that's finished the barbarian spawn action, so now the rest of the card will happen. This event is called a Splendid Year, and it's pretty simple. Many of these events have a lot more text, but this one simply says the active player gains three food. Now, this works out really well for them. They just got storage, so that means they can hold up to seven food. If they hadn't done that, they would have just taken two and lost the access. In this case, though, they do get all three of the food, and they're feeling pretty good about this, although they're not crazy about having a barbarian so close to their only city. After that, the event can be discarded. And then the yellow player can take three more cubes from their supply and fill this event track up so they will perform another event once all three of these have been placed. After that, the yellow player can take their second turn and they are going to found a new city right over here. This settler is going to go back to their supply and they can put a new city on that spot. And of course, it starts at the neutral mood. Now that they have two cities, that means they could construct a building into either of those, but they don't currently have enough resources to afford it. With that in mind, they've decided to activate this city to collect. Now, normally they would just take two, but at this point they've decided it's time for them to reveal one of their action cards. They've been holding onto this for the right moment, and this says Mass Collection. It says they can play this card when collecting resources, and it says they can collect two more resources than normal, but they still can only take one from a single space. It also says this cannot be combined with the Focused Collection or another Mass Collection card, because of course you could potentially have several of these action cards in your hand, and and combining those would be too powerful. Now, each of these action cards has two sides to them. The bottom part can be played in combat as long as you've researched the tactic advance on your player board. In this case, no players have the tactic advance just yet, but if they did, then they could play this card in combat to help that combat out. Obviously, in this case, they are going for mass collection, so that lets them get two more resources. Normally, they'd get two, but now they can take four from the options around this city. Once again, they spent an extra action to move this city farther away so that they would have even more options. Now, they do want to construct a building, and in order to do that, they are going to need an ore as well as a wood. 
And of course, the wood would come from there, and the ore could come from either of these mountains. Now they can collect two more resources, and they do have enough for one building. And while they would love to set themselves up to build a second building, they only can take one wood because there's just one wood adjacent to the city. That being said, they are going to take a second ore. And at this point, they've taken two ore and one wood, so the only options left to them are going to be food. So they will take one food, bringing them up to four. Well, that's finished their third action, so their turn is done. When we come back to the round tracker, you can see that we finished three rounds to the game, and that is going to finish the first age. Now, as we proceed from this round up to that one, before we actually start this, it's time to perform the first status phase of the game. Now, the status phase has six different steps that we are going to perform in order, and in each of these steps, we are going to go in player order, starting with the starting player person and going clockwise. Once we've all performed that step, we can move to the next one, and it's worth noting that there is no difference between the status phase when you're playing the base game and when you're playing with the expansion. Now, the very first step allows players in turn order to complete objectives. Once again, our objective is Wonderful or Outpost, and it has a status phase option for both. If at this point we were the only player to construct a wonder during this previous age, we would achieve Wonderful. And the other option says if at this moment we had armies in at least three different land spaces that are not adjacent to any of our cities or in cities, then we would achieve Outposts. Obviously, we have not achieved either of these, so we can keep this in our area. And over here, the Kelt player does have two of these objectives, and they can complete one or more of them now, since we went first, and now they get to go. Despite having two options, they have not achieved either yet, so that means no one is going to be claiming an objective. After that, the next step allows all players to receive a free advancement. We once again do this in player order, so that means we get to take a free advancement, and we take a cube from our event track and place it onto our board. Obviously, we have a bunch of options, and I think the one I'd like to go with is going to be math. Now, that is going to get us one culture, and we need culture in order to construct some wonders. And then math also does a couple other things for us. When we focus in, math has unlocked the observatory if we are playing with the expansion, and we are indeed playing with that today. If we look at our cheat sheet, the observatory is right over here. It, as always, costs the same amount as everything else, one food, an ore, and a wood. And it says that when you build this, you immediately gain one action card into your hand. So that is certainly a nice option that we can have for constructing in the future. Now, the main reason we are going for math, though, is because this effect says that engineering and roads can be bought at no food cost. When we focus out a little bit, you'll notice engineering is here and Rhodes is over there. And engineering is required if we want to construct a wonder. It says we would immediately draw a wonder card and then we may construct a wonder into one of our happy cities. Now that means we definitely want to advance engineering in order to construct that wonder. So I figure going into math with this free advancement is great because now we can advance into engineering without spending any of our food. This also says we can advance into roads at no food cost. And this makes us more flexible out on the map. When we focus in, roads would get us one culture, which we might need to construct a wonder, and then it gives us this effect here. It says that while moving, we may ignore terrain and or move two spaces if moving into or out of a city, but this would cost a food and an ore per group that we activate it for. Spending food and ore is significant, but moving two spaces for one action is also a very significant effect. Obviously, we don't have engineering or roads just yet, but we're setting ourselves up to be able to get those without paying any resources. Now, at this point, we've pulled our third cube from the event stack, so it's now time for us to perform an event. So we can draw from the top of the stack, and we got a wildfire. Now, before we actually perform this, we do get to gain two gold, and that's pretty great. Gold is wild, so we go up to two, and I think the bottom part's going to be bad considering the top part was very good for us. If we look at the specifics here... It says if we have any cities on forest spaces, we have to select one of those cities. We do currently have a city over here, so we have to select this one. And then it says we have to reduce the happiness by one step in that city and in any player cities on forest spaces connected to that city by a continuous chain of forest spaces. Fortunately for us, we don't have any other cities in this contiguous forest. So the wildfire is going to burn through here and lower the happiness of this city down once and it won't hit anything else. It says down below, if we did not have any cities on forest spaces, then we would have lost one wood if possible. We currently don't have any wood. Would, so that would have been pretty great to happen, but either way, in this case, it looks like we are a little bit penalized, but gaining that two gold was certainly a nice effect, and this event could have been much worse. That event is done, so we can refill our event track. And now the yellow player can take a free advancement, and they are going to go for public education. That has a yellow border, so they will gain one mood token. 
and then when we focus in, it says that whenever they do a collect action, one time during that collect, they can gain an idea if the city has an academy. Currently, they haven't built any academies, but they do have the option to. So by going into public education, it feels pretty likely that they're going to build at least one academy soon. After that, in player order, we all draw one new action card and one new objective. Our action card is Inspiration. It says as a free action, we could duplicate an advance that another player has without spending any food, but we have to have a unit within two of one of their cities. It appears our opponent has a city that's three away. So if we got a unit to here or closer, we could use Inspiration to get a free advancement that they have. That does seem pretty nice. The bottom is only usable in combat if we have the tactic advance. Now the objective has two options as normal. The top is Seafarer, and it says during the status phase, if we have all four of the maritime advancements, we could do this. The bottom one is Aggressor. It says you can complete immediately after eliminating at least two army units in a battle you started against another player. Well, we already have one advancement in Maritime, so we just need three more to complete Seafarer, and I think that might be something we're going to try to work towards. Now, we got this action. We haven't actually looked at the other action that we started the game with. This one is Tech Synergy, and it says, as an action, you can buy two advances in the same category. For both, you use cubes from the supply, not the event tracker. Now, you have to actually pay for both of those, but it lets you have a double advance, which is effectively like a free action. We just haven't been in a position where we had enough food to do that. Of course, the problem there is we don't have storage, so we are capped at two. Now, we can use ideas or gold in order to do an advance, and we do have two gold. So that means if we got a couple of food, then in the future, we could use this tech synergy, spend the two gold and the two food to advance twice if we wanted to. It is nice that when you use this, you pull from your supply, not from the event tracker, especially if you are worried that an event could hit you at a particularly vulnerable moment. Now, obviously, we don't have this food just yet, and now the yellow player can draw a new action and objective card. Those will go into their hand. And then the next thing we can all do is optionally raise one of our size one cities. Now we have one size one city, so if we wanted to, we could raise this. That means we'd put this back into our supply and we would gain one gold. Now that doesn't seem great, but we could use this later on in the game if we have a city in a position that we don't like and we'd rather found it into a new location using a settler. One reason to do this might be if you think an opponent is about to invade and take that city over, and another reason I suppose would be if you really need that gold, although that does seem like a pretty costly thing for one gold. I think it's pretty obvious that both of us are going to pass on optionally raising one of our cities, so now we can go into the fifth step of the status phase, where we all have the option of changing our government. With this in mind, let's focus back on our advance board and specifically look at the bottom three categories. Now, these are special. Each one of them is a government type, and you'll notice they have a different background. Now, you are only allowed to have advancements in one of these government areas at a time. So that means doing something like this would be illegal. Now, the next thing to note is that you can only advance into a government once you have the prerequisite for it. That is going to be the one just above it in the next section. So in order to start democracy, which would be voting first, we would need philosophy in order to go into nationalism, which is the first one for autocracy, we need a draft. And finally, if we wanted dogma, which is the first for theocracy, we would need state religion. Obviously, we don't have any of those, but for example's sake, let's pretend that we had this situation right here. Now, at this moment during the status phase, we could change our government. The way we do this is we have to spend one culture as well as one mood from our supply, and then we take all of our tokens from one of our government and we move them all to a different government that we had the prerequisite for. Remember, you always have to have the top one first, and then you could choose any of the bottom ones down over here. This is nice because it means you don't have to commit to a government type as you're playing the game. You do have options to change if the situation on the board changes for you. Now, obviously, we don't have any of these, and neither one of us is in a position to change a government. The final thing we have to do during the status phase is figure out who is going to get the starting player token for the next age. The way we do this is we count up the number of culture tokens and mood tokens that we have, and the player with the most total is going to take this. We have three total, and our opponent has four, so that means, unfortunately, they are going to take the starting player token, and they will go first for the next three rounds. It's worth noting, if there was a tie and one of the tied players was the previous starting player, then they would get to choose who from the tied players would be the starting player. Lastly, if there was a tie and the previous starting player was not a part of that tie, then the starting player token would move to the tied player that is closest in clockwise order from the previous starting player. Now, we don't have a tie in this situation. Yellow has a majority of them, so yellow now has that starting player token. 
This means we've completed the first status phase of the game, and it's now time to have the first round of the second age of the game. Now, before we get to that, I'd like to talk a little bit more about how the game will end. Remember, each of these status phases has six steps to them, and after we complete the first step, where we can optionally complete objectives, we then check to see if the game is over. If at this point we are in the final status phase, then that will end the game. And the other thing is, if during a status phase in the middle of the game, any one player has no cities on the board, then that will trigger the game end condition. So, if any player gets eliminated, the game will end shortly thereafter. Before we move on, I would like to talk about three variants that you can use to change how the game will end. The first is you can simply play the game with a short game variant, where you end the game after four full ages. In this case, you actually start the game with two settlers on the board instead of one, and during each of the status phases, you get two free advancements instead of one. The next two variants involve the back of this tracker. The first of these is called Roll for the End, and it involves these red numbers. Now, if you are starting a round that has a red number, then the starting player is going to roll one of these dice. This is a d12, but it has two of each symbol, so it's effectively a d6. And if the rolled number falls in the range depicted, then instead of playing the round, you will immediately go into the final status phase before the game ends. So, if a 6 was rolled right here, that would end the game, and you would play through 5 less rounds. Obviously, the number that you need to end the game is going to get bigger as these progress, and it's possible you might play through all of these ages. Now, I do want to point out that this side of the round tracker has 7 ages instead of the 6 that shows up over here. So, that means it's possible you could have a much longer game if you are playing with this variant. Now, the other variant that uses this board is called a Wonderful Ending. The way this works is if during any of the five final rounds of the game a player constructs a wonder, then that will trigger the end of the game, you will finish that round, and then move into the final status phase. So, if you get to this point and a player builds a wonder during this second round of the sixth age, then you would end the game after that. So, just like the other one, it's possible this could be an even longer game if players don't construct a wonder until you finally get to here. Obviously, we are not using either of these variants, I just wanted to talk about these a bit so that you could see how the game could be shorter or longer if that's what you'd prefer. Well, it looks like Yellow can now take their turn. For their first action, Yellow is going to activate this city, and they are going to construct a building. Currently, the only building they can construct is Academy, which they unlocked by advancing riding. And remember, normally this would cost a food, an ore, and a wood, but they actually have a card. Now, this one is going to be played. It says City Growth, and it says if they spend one culture back to the bank, then as an action, they may construct a building at no resource cost. So this is what they're going to do, which means they can take one academy and construct it into one of their cities. That makes it a size 2, which is fine, considering they do have two cities on the board. They're going to put this academy right over there. And then after that, they can take the Academy Construction Bonus. That says they will gain two ideas each time one is constructed, so they will take their first two ideas of the game. For their second action, they want to increase the happiness of the city over here. It's a size 1, so they have to spend one of their mood tokens, and they can just put that right over here, showing that that city is now happy. Now, they do have one more action they can take, and with it, they are going to activate the city. Remember, increasing the happiness is not a city activation. If they activated that city, that would be the second time in this round, which would lower that city's happiness, and that's not something they want to do. So they'll activate this city for the first time in the round, and they're going to build an academy into that city as well. That's going to cost a wood, an ore, as well as a food, and they can place that right over here, and that is also going to get them two more ideas, which means they're now up to four. All right, that's finished Yellow's turn which means now we can go. I think to start things off, let's use this tech synergy. Remember, this card says as one of our three actions, we can buy two advances from the same category. And I think let's go ahead and buy engineering and roads. If you remember from before, our math advance says that engineering and roads will cost no food. So we can, as one action, do both of these and not spend any resources. That card says we place cubes from our supply, not from the event track. So we're going to put this one right over here on roads. That has a blue border which means we can take our fourth culture of the game, and then for the second advance, let's go for engineering. The effect of engineering says we immediately draw one wonder card, and now for the rest of the game, we may construct wonders into our happy cities. So we can draw the top wonder card from the deck, and that is the Great Arena. Now, as you can see, these are expensive to build. This needs five ore, four wood, three food, and five culture tokens. In addition to that, we need the Circus and Sports Advance, which currently we don't have, but we do have Arts, which means at any point we could advance into Circus and Sports. Now, looking at these resources, in order to have three food, we would need storage, but of course we could use gold instead of a food to make up for that. Now, we don't currently have the culture, and we certainly don't have the ore or the wood, but now that we have this in our hand, we can work towards it. Now, it has a special effect, 
As you can see, once we build this out, it says we may spend our culture as if it was mood tokens and vice versa, except when spending culture to construct wonders. It also says that after any combat roll, we can spend mood or culture to add plus one hit once per land battle. Now, I'll explain how combat works later on, but for the moment, we can just keep this in our hand and continue to work towards being the first civilization to construct a wonder. Well, that's one action done, and I think for our second two actions, let's activate each of our cities to collect resources. It really is a shame that Wildfire knocked the happiness of this city down one, because remember, when you collect resources, you get a number equal to the size of the city, plus one if that city is happy. So that means this is going to collect two resources, whereas it could have collected three if it had continued to be happy. Of course, that Wildfire did give us two gold, which is nice and flexible, but also we now need two mood tokens in order to increase the happiness of the city, because it's now a size two. So let's activate this city and collect two resources. The first thing we can do is collect from this sea space. And since we have a port, that says instead of collecting a food from there with our fishing, we can take a gold or we could take a mood token. Considering I think we want to make this city happy again, I think we should collect a mood token. And then let's collect food from this plains here. We have one action left and let's activate our other city. And with it, I think let's collect a food from the plains. And then one wood from this forest here. All right, that's finished a relatively simple turn for us. This means the round is over, and now Yellow can go again. For their first action, they've decided to advance. They're going to spend two of their ideas, and then they're going to advance into Tactics. That has a blue border, so they'll get a culture. And then we can see that that unlocked the ability for them to construct these fortresses out into their cities. In addition to that, they may now use the Tactic bottom part of action cards in their hands. There is one more benefit, and it says that they can now move their army units. Up to this point, no one has actually constructed any of these, but until you have tactics, you can only recruit those army units into your cities. They cannot move out until you have tactics. Before Yellow moves on, they've also gained a civilization advancement because their tribal warfare activates when they advance into tactics. So they can place this cube from their supply over there, and it says that now for the rest of the game, when they do a combat roll versus the other players' armies, they add one hit for each barbarian city that is within two spaces of where that battle takes place. Now, I haven't talked about combat just yet, but as you can see, the Celtic player actually gains benefits for fighting near those barbarian cities. Quickly glancing at the rest of these advancements, you'll notice this barbarian symbol shows up in all of them, and that means the Celt player interacts with the barbarians more than most other civilizations. Well, Yellow's finished one action, and for their second one, they are going to activate this city and collect resources. It's happy, and it has a size 2, so that means they get to gain 3 resources total. And they've decided to take one food from the plains. They will also take an ore from this mountain right here. And lastly, they will collect wood from this forest. After that, for Yellow's final action of their turn, they are going to activate this city, and they are going to do the first recruit action of the game. When you do this, you can recruit a number of units up to the size of the city, plus one if that city happens to be happy. So since this is a happy city, that's going to be the size of two plus one, which means they can recruit up to three units. Now, it's worth noting that there is a stacking limit on every spot in the game with regards to army units. These settlers over here aren't army units, but everything else is, and what that means is no player can ever have more than four of their army units on a given space. So the yellow player can recruit up to three times into this city, and they've decided to start by recruiting one settler. As you can see, the cost for that is going to be two food, and I do want to point out that since this doesn't have that arrow on it, this is obviously not an expansion piece, and you'll notice that the costs and benefits for the non-expansion pieces do not change when you use the expansion. So they can spend two of their food, and as you can see, the settlers do not interact in combat, and as an action, they can found a city, which of course is something that we've seen already. So that means that yellow can spend two of their food, and place a settler right over here, and of course they can recruit up to two more times. In this case, they've decided to recruit two infantry. Each of them is going to cost one food and one ore, and as you can see, infantry will roll one die in combat, and they also have a clash ability which gets them one hit. Now, I'll explain how that works soon enough. Now that we have some army figures on the board, it's possible we might see some combat soon. In this case, though, they're going to spend two food and two ore to place two infantry right over here. All right, that's finished their recruit action. And before we move on, I just realized that for the second action, when they collected over here, there is an academy in that city, which means their public education advance should have activated. Once again, that says that once per turn, when they do a collect action in a city that has an academy, they can gain one idea, so they should have one more idea. All right, yellow is done, which means we get to go again. 
And considering we are going to need circus and sports in order to construct this great arena, I think let's start by advancing into that. That is going to take two of our food. We can then place this right over here, and it has a yellow border, so that will get us another mood token. This means we have two mood tokens, and we've also gained a new effect. This says that as an action, we can pay one or two of our culture in order to increase the mood of one of our cities by one or two steps. Remember, normally when you do this, you have to spend a number of mood tokens equal to the size of the city to increase the mood, which is certainly going to be effective as our cities get bigger. Speaking of that, I think we should now make this city happy again. Now what this means is instead of spending our two mood tokens, we could spend one of our culture. But remember, we need five culture in order to construct this great arena. So I think we are not actually going to use the circus and sports effect just yet. Let's use both of these mood tokens. And obviously, as these cities get bigger, we will likely use culture to increase the happiness instead. So the city is now happy. And for our third action, let's activate this city and collect resources. Now this port lets us take a gold or a mood token and I think we're going to take the gold for some extra flexibility. Now, this is a happy city of size 2, which means we can collect up to 3 resources. And for the other 2, we can either take 2 wood or a food and a wood. I think we want to do the split, so we can take a wood and a food, and that has finished our turn. This means we can move into the third round of the second age. The yellow player once again starts, and they've decided they want to spend their first action moving. They are going to activate over here, and as you can see, this is one group of units. Now, you can move up to three groups, and what that means is if they move all of these in the same direction, that would be one group. But if they split this up, then that will turn into multiple different groups. In this case, they want to start by making this settler a solo group. They're going to split off and explore onto this spot here. So this can be flipped up. Oh! And that's interesting. So this could go like this or like that. And obviously they can't go there because their settler would be in water. And they also need to match up water if possible. So there are a couple of reasons why this has to go just like that. And it appears there's a big swath of water that's almost cutting this land mass in half. After that, I'm feeling even happier about the fact that we have a port over here. It probably makes sense for us to maybe get a ship because ships can move very quickly through water. And I'll explain how that works later on. Now, it's entirely possible that when this tile flipped, it could have been something different that did not connect these up, but obviously this is an advantageous position for us to be in once we actually build some ships. Well, the yellow player can move up to two more groups, and they've decided to move both of these infantry over there. Remember, you can only move army units once you have the tactics advance, and the yellow player picked that up on their last turn. It appears yellow is going over here to defend their area from these barbarians that might be advancing in here soon. Well, yellow has two more turns, and for the next one, they are going to collect resources over here. That means they can collect three resources total, and when they collect in a city that has an academy, they gain an idea once per turn. So that academy will get them one idea, and then for the resources, they've decided to take one ore as well as two food. After that, they have one more action, and while they don't love this position for a new city, they think founding a new city here is probably going to be good. They could move over here, of course, but that would be an even worse position, and if they want to get across the water, they need to build a port, and then build a ship, and then move across that, or go the long way around with the settler, and that would cost a lot of actions. At the moment, both of their cities are a size 2, so even if they advanced into fishing, they would not be able to build a port, so they've decided it makes sense to found right over here. This means that their third city is now on the board, and since they have three cities, every one of their cities can go up to size 3, so now they could build a port in this city, or of course they could build it in this city as well. Well, let's finish to Yellow's turn, which means we now get to go. I think let's start by collecting resources in this city. We get to take three, and with this port, I think we should once again take a gold, because we could take a gold or one mood token, or of course we could just take food, but of course gold could be food, so we would obviously take that instead of collecting food. After that, we can collect two more resources, and I think we will take two wood. After that, I think we should construct a building over here. Part of me was holding off to try and construct the great arena over there, because while these aren't technically buildings, they do increase the size of the city. And remember, your max city size is equal to the number of cities that you have out here, and we currently have two. Now, I feel like that might be a little too short-sighted. Obviously, if we construct a building over here, then that will increase the amount that we can collect from this area. So, let's construct a building. That will cost one ore, one of our food, and one of our wood. And then let's build an obelisk. Remember, this is an expansion building, and it was unlocked when we advanced into arts. We can place the obelisk right over there. 
And then our Stella's advance says that we will gain one culture or one idea whenever we construct an obelisk, found a city, or capture a city, and we did construct an obelisk. Remember, this great arena does require us to have five culture, and we had four, so this is going to get us the fifth culture that we needed. We can place that right over there. And then we can look at the benefit of having an obelisk. That says that the obelisk building is immune to the culture influence action, and it stays in a player's color even if the city is captured. Now, on that note, I know I've mentioned this many times, and I think now is a good moment to explain what the influence culture action is. This is one of the six action options that you can take on your turn. And the way it works is you start by selecting one of your own cities, and then you are going to try to influence an opponent's building in one of their cities from that starting city. So, for example, if we wanted to take an influence culture action right now, we could start with this city or that one, and we'd maybe go with this one. Now, the range for this influence action is going to equal the size of the city. So, in this example, it's a size 2 city, so the range would go 1, 2. It's worth noting that you cannot influence over unrevealed areas. Now, in this case, we would not actually be in range. But fortunately, we could spend culture to increase the range by one for each that we spend. So coming back to this example, we could go one, two, and then spend a culture to increase our range by one, which would get us to here or here. Now, you can't actually influence a city that does not have any buildings in it. So this is not a legal target. So if we wanted to influence this city over here, we would need one, two, three, four. Our range is two. So we'd have to spend two of our culture in order to make that range. Once the range has been established, it's now time to see if we influence. We do this by rolling a die, and this is a d12 that has the values 1 through 6 printed on it twice. So effectively, this is a d6, and you roll the die, and then if the value that you rolled is equal to 5 or 6, then you successfully influence. Now, obviously, this is a terrible roll. We got a 1, but after we roll the die, we can continue to spend our culture to add 1 to the value of that roll until we hopefully get to a 5 or a 6. Now, it's worth noting we don't have to spend this culture. In fact, if we added three to this one, we'd only get to four, and that would not be enough. So there would, of course, be no reason to spend these. Now, let's just pretend this roll had gone a little differently. Maybe we got a three. In this case, in order to get to a five, we would need to spend two of our culture, adding two to the three. And now we would have successfully influenced. When you do this, you are going to swap out one of the buildings in that city with one of your own. So that means we would influence this academy. This would go back to the yellow player, and we would place one of our own academies down over here, even if we don't currently have the advance that would let us construct academies. Now, the yellow player does still control this city, so that means for all intents and purposes, they have an academy over here, but we have influenced that academy, so at the end of the game, we are going to score the victory point for this academy instead of the yellow player. Now, I haven't talked about final scoring just yet, and I will get to that soon, but simply put, every piece in one of your cities is worth one victory point, so yellow had a two-point city over here when that academy was theirs, and now we are going to take that one point away from them. So that's effectively a two-point swing on the yellow player for end game scoring. Once again, this is still technically their academy since they have this city out here for all other non-scoring purposes. Now, way back at the start of the tutorial, I mentioned that you can perform all of these actions multiple times, with the possible exception of influence culture. Now, that exception is the fact that you can only successfully influence culture once per turn. So if we did this and we successfully influenced that academy, we could not perform any more influence culture actions on this turn. If instead we went with our original roll of one and we did not spend any extra, then that would essentially be a failed influence culture action. We would lose the culture that we spent to get into range, and then we could take another influence culture action on this turn, but we'd once again have to spend a couple of culture in order to get in range and roll this die again. Now, obviously, this is not what we're going to be doing on our turn. And you should now understand why the obelisk power is pretty great. Players are unable to ever influence this away from us. So by constructing this, we have guaranteed that victory point for us at the end of the game. Now, I haven't talked about combat and taking over cities just yet, but I do want to point out that if somebody was to come over here and take the city over, this would maybe go away and it would turn into a barbarian state if the barbarians attacked, or maybe if the yellow player attacked, it would become yellow. And in this case, the obelisk would still stay as ours. Normally, when you take over a city, you swap out the color of all of the matching buildings to the city that was taken. So in a different example, if the yellow player took over this city, then they would also take over the sport and swap it out for one of theirs. Once again, I'll explain how we take over cities soon when we cover combat. I suppose the final thing I should note is that if an opponent ever takes over a city and swaps out the center with their piece, they swap out all of the buildings that match the color of this piece, but not the buildings that don't match that color. So if this was a three-player game and we had another player take this over, we would actually get to keep this here, while all of the other yellow buildings would turn into the color of that player who invaded.
Well, we have one action left, and while we still do want to construct that wonder, we are going to need a third city in order to have space to make that happen, and I think that's fine. Focusing on getting a wonder out too early is probably going to hamper our overall engine building as we go through the game. Now, I don't think I want to activate either of these cities again, because then they would lose happiness. We do have circus and sports, so we could spend a culture to increase the happiness, but we also have to spend an action to do that, and I don't think that makes sense. Instead, I think let's do an advance. That's going to cost two food, so we can spend one food and one of our gold. And there are two advances that I'd really like to do. One is medicine. That would get us another culture. And it says after we recruit, we would get one of our spent resources back. Currently, we don't have any units out, so gaining a one resource rebate does seem nice. But at the same time, irrigation also seems great for a reason that might not be apparent. Now, we know the yellow player has this already. It lets you collect uh, food from barren spaces, and currently none of our cities are next to barren spaces. But this also ignores the famine event, and more importantly, that activates the terracing advance on our Maya card. Now, I think we are going to go with irrigation, so we can place this over here. That yellow border will get us a mood token. And then we can place a cube down onto terracing from our supply. Now, this is important because it says our cities may now collect ore, wood, or food from mountain spaces. Our starting city is next to two mountain spaces and just one food. So that makes us very flexible with the resources we can harvest from there. I don't think we desperately need tons of ore in this moment. Although technically we do need five in order to complete this wonder. But completing that is still a ways off. The other effect of terracing says that our settlers and our leaders may now ignore mountain terrain penalties. Normally, if you move onto a mountain, then you cannot move anymore for the rest of the turn. But of course, we now get around that with our settlers and our leaders. Speaking of leaders, I think now's a good time to talk about them. Now, leaders come with the expansion. Each one of the civilizations has three leaders that you get at the start of the game. And when you do a recruit action, you are also allowed to recruit a leader. The cost for this is always going to be one culture and one mood token. And as you can see, leaders are going to roll one die in combat, which I'll explain soon. And they all have a clash ability in combat, which I will also explain. Now, whenever you recruit a leader, you're going to place your leader token out into the city that just did the recruit action. Each player has only one leader token, so that means after you have recruited one of these, you can put it on top of your civilization card. And then if you want to recruit a different one, you will actually have to permanently remove this from the game to place the new one out and then move this to the city that is recruiting the new one. Now, these leaders can die in battle. And if a player successfully defeats an opponent's leader in battle, they take the card and that card will be worth two points to them at the end of the game. Now, the main reason you want to actually recruit these leaders is because of the effects that each one of them has. They often have a combat effect for battles that they are in, and they also often have an effect that applies to locations they are in for other situations. For example, this leader over here can conditionally cancel a hit when they defend a city that have an obelisk in their color. And then as a separate benefit down below, it says that when constructing a building into his city, you pay one culture to reduce the cost by any two resources. So that's a nice discount for constructing buildings. This one adds two hits in combat when fighting within two spaces of one of our cities. And then she also has a beneficial effect that happens once she moves into an opponent's city and captures that city. So if we think we're going to capture a city, it might make sense to recruit this leader and then send them in with that attack to gain the benefit. Our last leader over here gives us a combat bonus depending on the size of the city that they are attacking. And then the other effect says that after we construct a building or a wonder in the city where this leader is, we may take an influence culture attempt in this city as a free action. And I did just explain how that influence culture action works. Now, once again, every civilization comes with these four specific advancements and three leaders that are specific to that civilization. Well, that's finished our turn, and the round is also over, so before we move into the third age, we have to, of course, perform a status phase. In player order, the first thing that we do is complete objectives, and it looks like the yellow player has completed one of their three. This is called Academic, and it says during a status phase, if they own more cities with academies than any other player, then they can achieve this and gain the two points. The yellow player currently has two academies, and we have none, so obviously they have more. So they'll get these two points. But before we move on, they could have also achieved this objective through Conqueror. That would have happened immediately after they captured another player's defending city, meaning a city with an army and or a fortress in it. Now, once again, we will talk about combat probably very soon. And for now, they have completed this so they can put it face up in front of them where it will be worth two points at the end of the game. 
That's the only one yellow can do. So now we can complete an objective if we want, but unfortunately we're not quite there yet. We haven't constructed a wonder and we don't have all four of the maritime advances. In fact, we still only have one of those. So we can hold onto these and move on to the next step where in player order, each of us is going to gain a free advance. The yellow player gets to do this first. After considering their options, they would like to take their free advance over here in economy. They don't have any over here, so they must go into the top. That has a yellow border, so they will gain another one of these mood tokens. They actually have three of those now. And then as a benefit, they have unlocked the ability to construct these markets when playing with the expansion components. When we focus in, the bartering advance also gives them access to a once per turn free action that lets them discard a card to gain one gold or one culture token. Well, it looks like yellow has once again cleared their event track, so it's time for them to perform another event. They can draw the top one from the deck, and this one is a great merchant event, but before we do any of that, it says Barbarians Move, and that is the icon for that movement in the top left. When Barbarians Move, there are three steps that have to be followed in order. The first step has the active player checking to see if there are any Barbarian armies within two land spaces of one of their cities. If that wasn't the case, then you actually stop this Barbarian's move action entirely, and instead perform a Barbarian spawn action, which we already saw earlier in the tutorial. Obviously, in this case, there is a Barbarian figure within two spaces of one of their cities, so they can continue on with the Barbarian move action. For the second step, the active player is going to move all Barbarian armies within two land spaces of their cities, one space, towards their nearest city, counting the shortest distance in land spaces and not going through unrevealed regions. If by doing this, a Barbarian enters a city or a spot with any units, then that will immediately cause combat. Now, the active player gets to decide the order of movement, and if there is more than one city equally close, they get to choose which of those cities the Barbarians will move to, but the Barbarian army does not split up. Likewise, if a Barbarian army has two spaces they could move on to that brings it one space closer to a city, then you get to choose which of those spaces it goes on to. So in this case, the yellow player can see there is a Barbarian here. It is two spaces away from each of these cities, so that means the Barbarian could go there, there, or there, and the yellow player gets to decide. Now they have set up a couple of their infantry over here, and they've decided they would actually like to fight this barbarian, so they're gonna have the barbarian move into this spot, which is closer to one of the yellow player cities, and now since there's at least one army unit in a space with multiple factions units, they will now immediately perform combat. Now combat can last through a series of rounds, and within each round there are five different steps that have to be followed in order. The first of these is a play action card step, and in it all players have the option of playing tactics cards. If you remember from before, tactics are the bottom half of the action cards, and you can only play these if you have the tactics advance. Now, the cult player does have tactics, so if they wanted to, they could play their one action card for that bottom effect. Now, if this was combat between multiple players, then the attacking player would decide first. Once the attacking player decided whether or not to put a card down, the defending player could also decide whether or not to put a card down, again, as long as they had that tactics advance. In this case, the yellow player is fighting the barbarians, though, so yellow could play a tactic card if they wanted, and the barbarians will never play tactic cards. In this case, Yellow has decided they'd like to play one tactic card, and then after both players have had a chance to play one, we move to the second step of the round, where we simultaneously reveal all of these cards. Now the effects will be activated. Sometimes it'll say on reveal, and other times it'll say things like this one, which says as a defender. This one is prepared defenses, and it applies to armies, fortresses, and ships. It says as a defender, they get to add one die to their combat roll. Well, the barbarians did move in here, so that means the yellow player is the defender, and the barbarians are the attacker. After that, it's time for the third step of combat, which is the combat roll. For this, players are going to roll one die for every unit they have in combat, and of course, the yellow player is going to roll one extra die because of their prepared defenses. So, these can happen simultaneously. We can roll these right over here and put them over. And then, of course, the barbarians are also going to roll one die because they have one unit. After that, each side needs to calculate their combat value for this roll. You start doing this by adding up all of the values on the dice. So yellow has 4 plus 3 plus 3 or 10, and the barbarians currently have 4. At this moment, players also have the option of activating clash abilities. You may have noticed these icons that show up next to the numbers, and for every single icon that matches a unit in this combat, you can activate that associated clash ability. 
This is for cavalry, and that one is for elephants. So if there was up to one cavalry, this could match that cavalry. And if there was an elephant, that could match the elephant. But obviously, there are neither of those currently in combat. There is one icon for infantry, though. So we can take a look at the cheat sheet, and we can see that the clash ability for the infantry is going to add one more to the combat value. So that means this can be assigned to that infantry, and instead of being at 10, they are now at 11. Now, if, for example, they had something like this, then they could have applied that clash icon to this infantry, but of course, that isn't how this shook out. Unfortunately for the barbarians, they rolled a cavalry symbol instead of an infantry symbol. If this had been infantry, then that would have applied for the barbarians and added one to the overall combat value as well. Now that we have the combat values of 11 and 4, we can move into the fourth step of the round where we will determine casualties. The way this works is we divide that combat value by 5 and then round down, and that will be the number of units that are destroyed in this battle. So for the yellow player, they have 11 divided by 5 rounded down, which will get them 2, and the barbarians have 4 divided by 5 rounded down, which just barely means they actually get 0 hits. If they had reached 5 or more, then that would have been enough to destroy one of the yellow player's armies. Obviously, that is not the case, and now the yellow player can inflict two damage, which will remove two units. Every unit in this game gets destroyed with a single damage. So the barbarian is going to be removed, and then simultaneously, if the barbarians had enough attack, they could have also potentially removed units. That's not the case here, though, so the barbarian is going to go back to the supply. And now it's time for an end of battle check. The first thing to look for is, are there currently multiple factions units in this space? Obviously, that is not the case, so that means the battle is going to be over, but if, for example, there was still a barbarian over here, then the next thing that we would do is check to see if the attacker retreats. Now, barbarians never retreat, but if instead this was one of our units and we were attacking, now would be the time where we could retreat. If we did, we would move all of our units back to where we came from. If we didn't retreat then we start a new combat round, once again having players potentially put cards down. Now obviously that's not the case over here, so the yellow player did successfully defeat the barbarians with one round of combat. Now as a benefit for defeating barbarians, players will always gain one gold for successfully defeating them. Now if players are able to capture a barbarian city, then they will also gain a gold for that. So yellow got their gold for defeating the barbarians, and they felt pretty confident they would defeat them, which is why they decided to send the barbarians towards the infantry they already had positioned on the board. That combat is over, but before we move on, I'd like to talk about capturing cities. If at any point there are player pieces on a spot with an opposing city and nothing to defend it, then the player with the army pieces is going to capture that city. They are going to swap the settlement token in the middle out with one of their own, and if this is a situation where there are buildings that match the color of that settlement, then the capturing player would also swap those buildings out into their own color. The only exception for that is if barbarians are able to capture a player city, they swap this out, but the buildings will just stay there, and they effectively act as if they were culturally influenced earlier on in the game. That means if this happened, and then we came in and won that back from the Barbarians, since these don't match, the Yellow Academy would still stay there. Now, when a player successfully captures a city, they are going to gain a gold benefit. If they captured a Barbarian city, then as I said, they will get one gold no matter how big the city is. But if in a different example, they captured an opponent city, and let's pretend it had a building like that, well, obviously when they did this, they would swap out the settlement, and they'd swap out this building, and then they would gain one gold for the size of that city. So this is a size two city, which means they would take two gold. If that city, when captured, happened to be happy, then the capturing player will gain one more gold for capturing it. But if when the city was captured, it was angry, then the capturing player would only get one gold, no matter how big the city is. After finishing the capture, the city will become angry, no matter what their mood was before. So that is how land combat works, but we can also fight in the water if we have multiple ships or if we have ships fighting the non-player pirate ships that can spawn out here on the map. Now I'll describe how ship combat works once we actually see a ship appear on the board, and I think we're probably going to make that happen soon considering we have a port and a nice big sea area for us to capitalize on. Well, let's come back to the game, and we are actually not done with the Barbarian move action just yet. There is a third step, and in that, the active player is going to place one new Barbarian unit into every city that is within two spaces of one of their own. Obviously, that is this one here, so a new Barbarian infantry is going to appear right onto that city. We can now move on with the event. So far, we've just covered the Barbarian's move, but now we have the Great Merchant. Now, many of these events have a purple banner at the top, 
And the way this works is it says the player who drew this may pay one culture in order to keep this card as an action card. If they don't do that, then they will pass this to the left until another player spends two culture to keep it. And if no one does, then this card is discarded. Now, in this case, I think the yellow player is going to spend their one culture because they'd rather we did not spend two to gain access to it. And when they play this as an action, they could do one or both of the following. This says they could get a free economy advance using a cube from the supply. And if they have the trade routes advance, they could generate income from all of their trade routes. After that, they would discard this to the discard pile. Now the trade routes advance is right over here, and considering the yellow player took this card, I think it's very likely we're going to see that get advanced into soon, and I'll explain how that works when that happens. After that, we can take our free advance, and I mentioned before that I really wanted medicine, but we went for irrigation instead. Well, let's now go for medicine. That's going to get us a culture. And then the effect says that after we recruit, we get one resource that we spent overall back into our supply. After placing that advance, we have no more cubes in our event track, so that means it's time for us to draw another event and perform it. Oh, it looks like this does not have an icon in the corner, which means we are just going to do the text on the bottom. Now this says Volcano, and it says if you have at least four cities, then we have to pick one of our cities. After that, we have to destroy that picked city along with any units on the space, removing them from the board. Then we keep this card and we place all of the city pieces from that destroyed city on top of the card. And then each building and settlement is worth two victory points to the player who owns the pieces in the case there happen to be other players' pieces on there due to cultural influence. Each wonder piece scores normally, but its powers no longer affect the game except for the Great Pyramids. So losing a city can be pretty detrimental, but remember each one of those pieces would have been worth one point at the end of the game, but when it's lost to this volcano, it becomes worth two, effectively because that city becomes a lot more famous and is known about in the world because of its destruction. Obviously at this point we only have two cities though, so this does not happen, and we can simply put this into the discard pile. After that, each player can draw a new objective and action card into their hand, so these are going to be ours. The objective says focused on top. It says during the status phase, if we have more advanced categories in all four advances than any other player, excluding civilization advances, then we can take this. Currently, we don't have any that are completely full, but we have one that's one away, and our opponent also has one. So we can keep that in mind, but the bottom part is a combat-related one. It says immediately, after winning a land battle against a player with more warfare advances, or against an army with more army units than yours, including the barbarians. So we could complete this objective if we have a particularly good fight that goes against the odds. The other card we got is an action. The top part says, teach us now. You can play this card after capturing another player's city, and it says we could duplicate one of that player's advances at no food cost. The bottom part is a tactic, it's archers, and you can use this with an army, and it says on reveal, you roll a die, and if you roll a 5 or a 6, your enemy immediately removes one army unit before making their combat roll. So we can add these into our hand, and now each of us have the option of raising a size 1 city, but I don't think either of us are going to do that, and after that we can change governments. Up to this point, no one has actually gained a government, but I explained how those worked earlier on. So now the final thing we do is determine the first player for the next age. The yellow player has four tokens combined with their mood and the culture, and we have seven. So that means we have more, and that means we can take this, and we'll be the starting player for the next three rounds. Speaking of that, we are now done with the second status phase of the game, and we could now start the first round. But before we get to that, I think it's now time to talk about how we get our final scores once the game is over. Now we'll count up our points once the game has come to an end, and I talked about that earlier on in the tutorial, and we are going to gain points for a variety of different things. The first thing we'll get points for is one point for every city piece that we have. Now that is going to be each settlement piece, as well as each of the buildings that we have in our cities, as well as in other cities that we might have culturally influenced. After that, we will gain half of a point for every advance that we have. Right now we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, so that would be 5 points worth of cubes. Of course, if we had this, then that would be 5.5 points worth of cubes. Next up, each player is going to gain 2 points for every objective that they have been able to complete. Obviously, yellow has completed one of those so far. And then after that, we will get 4 points for every wonder that we have control of. Now, you may have noticed in the bottom right corner of the wonder that we drew, it shows 4 points, and every one of them is going to be 4 points. Now, if you have a situation where you build a wonder into one of your cities, and then your opponent comes in and captures that city, taking it away from you, they take this card and put it in front of them. 
when they do that, the player who built this wonder puts a cube on top of that card, and at the end of the game, those two players are going to split those points. So it would be two points to the original builder, and then two points to whoever controls that city. Of course, if somebody else comes in and captures that city away from the person who captured it from you, then they take this card, and that cube stays on there, so you're guaranteed to get two out of these four points when you construct a wonder. Next up, players will gain potential points from events. We've already seen this volcano come out that could potentially give you points if your city got destroyed, and there are other events in this deck that have other conditional ways to gain victory points, and now is the time that you'll add those points into your final score. Finally, if you're playing with the expansion, then each player is going to gain two points for every enemy leader that they defeat. Obviously, that is not the case when you are playing without the expansion. Once you add all of these points up, the player with the most points will be the winner, and if there is a tie, then you go through this list, and whoever breaks the tie in their favor, gaining more from a specific item, will win the overall tie. So, that's how we score points once the game is over, and at this point, I think we're going to play through one more age. In that, we will be talking about some ships, and I'll try to find a moment to talk about pirates as well as the cavalry and the elephants that can potentially be put out on the board. I'm not going to be covering everything that you see here. There's just a lot in this game, and I'm trying to give you a good overall idea. Now, before we move on, I realized that both of us need to put three more cubes into our event tracks. And now let's start the first round of the third age of the game. We get to go first. For our first action, I think let's activate this city and collect. This is a great city for it because it's a size 2, and it's happy, so we get to collect three things, and it's next to two mountains. And remember, we have this terracing, which means we can take an ore, a wood, or a food from each of these mountain spaces, so they are super flexible for us. I think let's start by taking two food, one from this plains space and one from the mountain because of that terrace advance. That is two food total, which brings us to two, and that is currently our maximum because we have not invested in the storage advance. Now we can take one more resource, and I think we'll take an ore. After that, I think let's activate this city to recruit. It's a size two, and it's happy, so that means we could recruit up to three things if we wanted to, but I think we are just going to recruit twice. The first thing that we want to recruit is going to be a ship. Now, if we look over here at the cheat sheet, it says that ships are going to take two wood, and you can only build them if you have a port, and in fact, you build them onto the sea space that that port is connected to. We only have this port right here, so we can spend two of our wood to construct a ship right onto that sea space. After that, let's spend two of our food, and that is going to let us get another settler so that we can work towards getting a third city out on the board. That settler is going to go right over here, and at this point, we could recruit one more time. We do have three gold, but I like the idea of holding on to that gold for a moment where we really need it, and I'm not feeling like we desperately need another figure out here on the map. So I think we're just going to go with this two, and then our medicine is going to activate, and we get to take back one of our spent resources. We spent wood, and we spent food, and I think that we should take one food back. At this point, we've taken two actions, and I think it's finally time for us to play an action card. We've had inspiration in our hand for a while, and it says for a free action, we can duplicate an advance that another player has, excluding civilization advancements, at no food cost. Now, we can do this as long as we have a unit or a city within two spaces of a unit or a city of that player. As you can see, we now have a unit within two spaces of one of our opponent's cities, so we can use inspiration to essentially copy one of their advances. I did just complain about not having storage. That keeps us from having more than two food at any point in time, and the yellow player has invested in that, so I think we are going to use the inspiration to copy that, so we can take a cube from our supply and put it right over there. That is going to get us one mood token, and now for the rest of the game, we can store up to seven food. Well, we have one action left, and I think we want to move. Again, this lets us move up to three of our groups, and we're going to start by moving this settler onto the water, specifically onto the ship. Now, each ship can hold up to two units, and a unit on a ship is going to be carried with the ship when that ship moves, and you can move a unit that has already moved. So with our second move, I think we will move this ship along with the settler, and we're going to go all the way over here. Now, the reason we can do that is because a ship can go as far as you want within a given body of water. Now, it is worth noting that you have to advance one space at a time, because if, while you are moving, you land into a spot that has an opposing ship or maybe a neutral pirate, then you have to stop your movement there, and then you will have combat between those two ships. Naval combat works very similar to land combat that we've already described, with the main exception being that when a ship is destroyed, all of the units are also destroyed, and any units that are on board that ship have no effect in the overall combat. Fortunately for us, the yellow player has not found a way to put this ship down, and we haven't bumped into any pirates just yet. There are event cards that can spawn pirates onto the board, and the icon for that looks like this. When that happens, you actually bring two pirates out onto the board, and you have to put at least one of them onto a sea space that's next to one of your cities, so for example that, and then you can put the other pirate out on the board wherever you like, and you'll probably put it next to one of your opponent's cities if possible. 
Now, I do want to point out that pirates only exist in the game when you're using the expansion content, and they are pretty pesky. You can't move through them without having to stop and fight them just like they were a barbarian. And also, when these pirates arrive, each player who has a city next to them is going to have to lose one resource, or one mood, or one of their culture tokens. If they don't have any of those resources to lose, then that city that's adjacent to the pirate will go down one overall mood level. Now, pirates are just going to hang out in that spot without fighting them and blocking resource collection on that location. Fortunately, we haven't bumped into any of these pirates just yet, and we can now come back to our move, where I think we are going to go from here all the way onto this spot. Now, this location is next to two uncovered tiles, and you are allowed to explore with your ship. In this case, I think we want to explore onto this area, which means we don't actually go onto it just yet. Instead, we flip this over, and the way exploration works with ships is slightly different. If it's possible to orient the tiles so that the water connects to where the ship was going, then you must do so. So if this location or that location was water, we would have to prioritize doing that. In this case, that is not happening here. So the next thing we would check is by placing this like this, or that, are we connecting this up to other water, and it doesn't look like we are, so we can place it like this or that, because the water will be adjacent to the edge in both options. I think let's place it like this, and then we obviously don't move our ship onto that spot. If this had been a sea spot, we would have done so. At this point, we are done moving because we don't have any other groups to move. This settler already moved because they went onto the ship, and obviously the ship has moved. So if we want to move this settler off of the ship and onto one of these spaces to potentially found a city, then we are going to need to take another move action in the future. So that move action is done, but before we move on, I'd like to point out this specific advance called navigation. When we focus in, navigation says that ships may move around the board to the next group of sea spaces. What that means is if we had this advance, then, when we moved, we could take a ship and move it obviously as far as we want within that sea space, but we can also go around the outside of the board and land on the next available sea space on the edge. Now, you're not allowed to navigate past unexplored terrain like this. Instead, you'd have to stop there and explore it, unlike what I just showed you here. So, navigation can let you really move around the board. Of course, there needs to be some sea next to the edge, but when we explore, there is a prioritization of putting the sea next to the edge that is secondary to connecting sea up to other sea spots. Obviously, we aren't there right now, but that's definitely something that we can keep in mind for the future. Well, we are done with our turn, so the yellow player can go, and they've decided to start by activating this city to collect resources. It's a size 2, and it is also happy, so they can get 3 resources, and they've decided to collect 2 food, as well as 1 ore. After that, they're going to activate this city and recruit. They could recruit up to three times because it's a size two and it's happy, but they're only going to recruit twice. In this case, they would like to put two settlers down into that city. Each settler is going to cost two food, so they will go from four back down to zero. And I just realized that when they collected with their first action over here, there was an academy, so their public education should have given them yet another idea. They're up to five of those. They should certainly think about using those to do some more advances. At this point, the yellow player has one action left, and they've decided to play this event card that they got as an action. This is the Great Merchant, and it says that as an action, they can do one or both of the following. The first thing lets them get a free economy advance, and they can take one from their supply, and they're going to place it down onto trade routes. When they do this, they can also put a token down onto their Kelt board, because tribal trade matches up with trade routes. Now, I'll explain how those two work very soon because the second part of this card says if they have the trade routes advance, which they do now, then they can generate income from all of their trade routes. After that, this is discarded, and with that in mind, let's take a look over here to see how trade routes work. It says at the start of each turn for the rest of the game, you gain one food for every ship or settler that you have up to four that can pair with a different non-angry enemy player city within two spaces. So you can pair up a settler or a ship with an enemy city and get some free food out of it. That enemy doesn't gain or lose anything from the trade. This can get even better if you advance into currency that says you can get gold from taxation and trade routes instead of other resources. Up here, taxation says that once per turn as an action, you can pay a mood token to gain a food, an ore, or a wood for every city that you have. So obviously, if you get currency with taxation, you could get gold instead, which is even better. Now, at the moment, the yellow player does not have a settler or a ship within two spaces of one of our cities, but they do have tribal trade over here because they are Celtic. This says that they may establish trade routes with non-angry barbarian cities, but they only get food. They never get gold from them, even if they have the currency advance. 
Currently, they do have a settler that they can pair up with this barbarian city that's within two away. So that pair is going to get them a trade route. And remember, this says that they are going to activate the trade routes as if it was the start of their turn. So that is going to get them one food. And then if that's the case at the start of their next turn, that will get them yet another food. This is a great way to get food without working towards it, although you do have to keep the settlers around. You can do this with ships, though, and considering we have a ship out here on the board and we can easily make more, maybe we should consider trying to work our way towards trade routes to get some of that food ourselves. Well, the yellow player is done with their turn, so we can move into the second round of the Third Age. We get to go first, and I think I'd really like to get a third city down so that we can try to get that wonder constructed into one of these two cities here. So let's spend one action moving, and we are just, I think, going to be moving this settler over here. We could move on to that spot and then explore this, I suppose. And considering there are these yellow infantry over there, maybe it's a good idea to put one more space between us. Yeah, let's go ahead and explore here. This will flip over, and it doesn't have any water, so we can effectively put it like this or like that, and that doesn't make sense because you cannot build onto a barren spot. So I think we'll do this. The settler will go there, and then for our second action, let's found a city on this location. The settler can go back to our supply. We can then put a city right there, and then our Stellas will activate. We can take an idea, or we could take one culture when we found a city. And considering we have enough culture, I think let's take an idea to help us out getting some more advances without having to spend food. So that idea will bring us up to one. That's our first idea of the game. At this point, we have just one action left, and let's activate this city to gather resources. We will gain one, two, three resources, and I think we should certainly activate this spot with the port. That is going to get us one gold. And then after that, I think let's get an ore from these mountains and then a wood from this forest space. All right, that's finished our turn. This means yellow can go and they'll start by activating this trade route right here between them and this barbarian spot. Remember, normally you cannot trade with barbarians, but the Celtic player interacts with the barbarians far more than the other civilizations in the game. So that one pair is going to get them one food. And for their second action, they are going to advance. They're going to use two ideas to do this, and they want to advance into Draft. That has a blue border, so they will get one culture. And the effect of that says that when they recruit for the rest of the game, they can put a single infantry down by spending one mood token instead of the normal one food and one ore. So that is a nice discount, especially if you have these mood tokens available. But then in addition to that, they also get to advance into Tribal Allies. That does say draft right over here, and now it says for the rest of the game, one time per turn as an action, they can do a spawn barbarian action as if they had pulled that event card. Remember, this places a barbarian city down onto a location two away from one of that player's cities, and then you put one barbarian unit onto that city. In addition to that, it says after triggering a barbarian's move event, they can pay one food to prevent any barbarian armies they want from moving. So they could spend food to stop barbarians from invading in ways that they don't want. Of course, spending food isn't great, but that lets them keep those barbarians in check, which is especially good if they decide to start spawning new barbarians in their area. They're somewhat incentivized to do that now, considering they have tribal trade, so they could use this to put more barbarians out there to establish trade routes to then get more food at the start of their turns. Yellow has one action left, and they've decided to advance again. They're going to spend two of their ideas, and they're going to advance into nationalism. This is the first government advance that we're seeing in the game, and remember, they can only do that because they have the prerequisite advance that is one space above. When we focus in, it says after they do a recruiting action of at least one army or ship, they will gain one mood or one culture. Now, they are already incentivized to recruit infantry because they can do that once per recruit for one mood, which means if you do that with nationalism, that's effectively a full rebate for that one infantry. Yellow is done with their turn, so that means we can move into the third round of the third age, and we, of course, get to go. So we can take our turn, and we don't actually have this navigation advance. Now for this turn, I think I want to construct this wonder. We've been working towards it all game long, and maybe this isn't the right moment for us, but I just want to make it happen. This needs five ore, four wood, three food, and five culture, and we still need a decent amount of resources to pull that off. So let's spend our first action activating this city. That is going to get us three resources. This port can get us one gold, and then I think let's take two wood. After that, for our second action, let's activate this city over here. Unfortunately, we're only going to get one resource, but we need that one resource to pull this off on the turn. Now we could take an ore, a wood, or a food. And we actually could take a food from this barren spot because we do have irrigation. In this case, I think we'll just take a food. 
And then for our third action, let's use engineering, which will allow us to construct one wonder. Now this needs five ore, and we have two of it, so we could spend two along with three of our gold. Then we need four wood, and we have three, so we could spend three of it plus one gold to make up. And then we need three food, and we have two, so we could spend these two and one gold, which means we've spent everything except for our ideas in order to build this great arena right now. Now this does also cost five of our culture, and we've got six, so we can spend five of that back to the bank. And then we can take the great arena from the supply and put that next to one of our happy cities. Now, technically, this is a city activation action, and we activated this city right here. And again, we could do this to bring it up to a size three because we do have three cities out here. Now, that arena is going to stay there for the rest of the game, and we also will get four points for it at the end of the game as long as we still control this city. In addition to that, we have a couple of benefits. The top thing says we may spend our culture as if it was mood and vice versa, except when you are spending culture in order to construct more wonders. Now that's great. We currently have just one culture, but we have ways to make it. And mood is also good for a variety of things as we've seen. In addition to that, the great arena will give us a combat effect for as long as we have it. It says after any combat roll, we can spend one of our mood or one of our culture to add plus one hit once per land battle. So we could use that to get up to a number that is divisible by five to deal one more damage, which would remove one more unit, and that can be a pretty big swing in the heat of battle. So that wonder is constructed, and we can put this face up in front of us, and then we also can complete this objective. Remember, if it says status phase, then it only happens during the status phase, but this one also says immediately. It says on your turn, if you're the only player to have constructed a wonder, then you can complete this objective. We have indeed done that, so this is two more points to us. So by constructing this wonder, we've just gained six points for the end of the game. Also, this is now a size 3 city, so in the future, if we activate this to collect resources or recruit, then we will collect 4 resources or be able to recruit up to 4 units in that spot. Considering we have terracing, which lets us collect a food, an ore, or a wood from these mountain locations, this is a great spot to be a massive collector of resources as we continue through the game. Well, that's finished our third action. It took our entire turn to pull this off, and I'm really happy to get that wonder down on the board. This means it's now time for the yellow player to go and they've decided to start with a move action. They'll begin by moving this settler over there. They're going to split these up so they can explore onto this tile. It does have some water, and if they spin it like that, it will connect up to other water, so they're forced to do that. That unfortunately means the settler is going onto a baron's spot, so they won't be able to build a city on that location. Now they can move up to two more of their groups, and they've decided they're going to leave one of these infantry behind, but they'll move the other one onto this mountain spot. Remember, when you go into a mountain spot, you cannot move any farther. So that was a one move done. And if they do another move action, they cannot move this infantry because they're stuck in the mountains until their next turn. Before they take their second turn, I just realized they actually forgot to activate their trade routes. At the start of their turn, they did have a pair of their settler and one barbarian city using their tribal trade advance. So they should have gained one food from that before they actually took their first turn. Now for their second turn, they've decided to activate tribal allies. Again, this says once per turn as an action, they can do a spawn barbarian action as if they had just played an event icon. So they are forcing a spawn action. And remember, this has to go exactly two spaces away from one of their cities and no closer than two spaces to any opponent's city. Now they could put this right here. That would make it two spaces away from our city and theirs. But that is the only land space essentially cutting off one half of the map to the other. That means in order to move troops from here down there, which they might want to do to try and capture some of our cities, they'd have to go through this barbarian area. Now, if they did that, they could capture this city and turn it into one of theirs, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but they also like the idea of having barbarian cities out here that they can trade with. Now, I think they're actually going to do this. Another option would be going over there, but they like the idea of potentially capturing this city in the future. Next up, they have to put a unit into that city, and then after that, they have to place a unit into any barbarian city of their choice. I unfortunately made a mistake of this the first time we spawned. We put one down, but we did not put another one in. Now, in the combat that resulted, the yellow player did roll enough hits to fully wipe out those barbarians, but considering another die would have been rolled, the yellow player would have certainly lost one of their units in that fight. So, in order to try and fix that mistake that happened quite a while ago, let's remove this unit right here, because it should have been two yellow versus two barbarians, and remember the barbarians had just four combat value. So, by rolling one more die, which they should have for having one more infantry, they would have had a minimum of plus one, so that means one of these would have been destroyed. It's possible that both of them would have been, but there's only so much corrections we can do for mistakes like that. Sorry. 
So coming back to this spawn event, the yellow player can spawn into this spot or that spot. And considering we are playing with the expansion and there's already an infantry in each of those, if they wanted to, they could put a cavalry down into that location or an elephant. If you're not playing with the expansion, you simply put more of the barbarian infantry units down. Well, now is a great time to talk about the cavalry and elephants to see if yellow wants to place any of those down. If we look at the expansion side of the player aid, we can start with cavalry. Now to start, if players want to recruit cavalry, they have to have a market in that city. The same goes for the elephant, and you can unlock building a market by going into bartering. The yellow player has already done that, but they have not spent the time to construct a market into one of their cities. If they did though, they could then recruit a cavalry and or an elephant into that city. Looking back at the cheat sheet, you can see that when recruiting these, it is going to cost one food as well as one wood to recruit cavalry, and it's just two food to recruit an elephant. Now, looking at the combat effects for the cavalry, we can see they roll one die in combat like normal, and then the clash effect, which happens when you roll a horse head when you're in this combat, is going to be adding two to the combat value, which is, of course, one better than the clash ability for the infantry. So cavalry have a better chance of doing extra damage in combat. Looking down at the elephant, we can see they roll one die in combat, just like everything else. And the clash ability, if you have a elephant head roll on a die in combat with an elephant, lets you cancel one hit that comes in, but you have to disregard the combat value of one of your rolled dice. Obviously, you would disregard the worst die that you rolled, and absorbing one hit coming in is effectively like negating five combat value from your opponent. So the cavalry are slightly more offensive, and the elephants are slightly more defensive. In this current situation, Yellow has decided they would like to try and put pressure on us, so they are going to spawn a barbarian cavalry into that city. So that means in the future, if we do a Barbarians Move event, these are going to move closer to our city, and obviously this cavalry makes it more likely that we will suffer damage. Of course, if the yellow player pulls a Barbarian's move, it would head towards their city, but remember, their Tribal Allies effect lets them spend one food to stop the movement entirely of a group of Barbarians. Well, yellow is now done with their action where they were able to spawn a Barbarian city, and as you can see, they can now have a trade route pair with the Settler and that city, so at the start of their next turn, as long as it looks like this, they can pair these for a food and pair those for a food, so they are now generating two free food at the start of each of their turns. Of course, if the yellow player's plan goes well and these barbarians move away from the city, then yellow has positioned themselves to simply move over there and immediately capture that city without even having a fight. Well, yellow has one action left, and they're going to spend an idea as well as one of their food, and with this they are going to advance. In this case, they've decided they would like to go to fishing. That is going to unlock the ability for them to build a port, and considering you can do trade routes with ships and there's a long piece of water that could get their ships close to ours, they've decided they'd like to make ships to get more out of those trade routes. So in the future, they now can build these ports, and also they have the ability to collect food from sea spaces. At this point, they've once again cleared their event track, so they have to immediately perform an event. In this case, that is going to be a good year. The first thing that happens is an exhausted land, though. This means they have to take one of these exhausted land tokens and put it adjacent to one of their cities on a location that is not barren and that also has no units on it. Overall, they feel like they have a lot of access to mountains, so they're going to put this token right over here. That means for the rest of the game, no cities can be founded here, and it's impossible to harvest resources from this mountain spot. After that, there is a nice, simple, universal event. It's called A Good Year, and it says all players gain two food. So, yellow gains two food, bringing them to four, and we gain two food, bringing us to two. Well, that simple event is done. So, yellow can refill their event track, and they finish their turn. Well, the third round of the third age is done, so it's now time for the third status phase of the game. Starting with us, we could claim objectives, although we haven't completed either of these. We still have just one advance in Maritime for the Seafarer, and the Focused says we have to have more advanced categories with all four than any other player. We have two of them that need just one to have four, and our opponent has none, so that means if we had advanced into Sanitation or Husbandry instead of perhaps Medicine, then we would now be able to get this Focused, but we are still in a position to, I think, get this done before the game is over. Now, of course, each of these does have military aggression type options at the bottom, but so far in this game, we've been avoiding making any armies at all. We've mostly been focusing on building and constructing a wonder. Up here, the yellow player has three objectives, but they have not completed any of them. 
After that, we each get a free advance, and I think the best thing for us is probably bartering. That not only lets us discard a card to get a gold or one culture, and we do have some cards that we might not get played. For example, this Teach Us Now requires us to capture a city, and I'm not sure if that's going to be happening. So we could potentially turn this into a gold at the right moment. But in addition to that, we now can build these markets, which would let us recruit cavalry as well as elephants. Now, the main reason we're doing this is because in the future, that will unlock the ability to do trade routes, and we already have a ship out there on the board. So as soon as we have trade routes going, that ship is within two spaces of an opposing city, and that can start getting us some free food of our own. We could go even harder and get currency so that we would get free gold instead of free food. I think those would probably be the next two advances that we would really want to do. Next up, Yellow can advance, and they are going to go for Absolute Power. This is one of their government advances. When we focus in, Absolute Power says once per turn, they could pay two of their mood tokens to take an entire extra action. That could be really powerful, and currently they actually have three mood tokens, so they are well positioned to get some extra actions. After that, we can all draw a new objective and action card. Our objective is Coastal Culture. That says during the status phase, if we own more cities with ports than any other player, we could get these two points. If we had this in this round, that would have actually been good because we have one port compared to the zero of our opponents. Our opponent can build ports, but we can keep that in mind and maybe build another one of our own over here to try and get this going in the future. The other option is Warmonger at the bottom. It says you can complete this immediately after having fought two battles on your turn against two different armies or cities, including barbarians, and winning slash capturing at least one of those. The other card we get is an action card. It's Good Ideas. You can play this on your turn after capturing a city or winning a battle against an enemy, including barbarians, and you get two ideas. That's pretty simple. The bottom is a tactic called the Siege. You can use this with an army, and it says if you are attacking a city, you can add one to your combat value for a combat roll. And it also says that no clash abilities will activate on your enemy's combat roll. This says your enemy may pay two food prior to their combat roll to cancel the second of these two effects. After that, our opponent will draw one of each of these as well. And then each of us will decide not to raise one of our cities. After that, the yellow player does have a government, so if they wanted, they could spend a culture as well as one of their mood tokens to change governments, which means they'd move both of these tokens over to one of these two other options. Unfortunately for them, they don't have the prerequisites for either democracy or theocracy, so even if they wanted to change their government, they currently could not. The final thing to do is determine start player. We have three culture and mood combined, and our opponent has five, so that means they will be the starting player for the next age of the game. The third status phase is done, and now it would be time for us to play the first round of the fourth age, but I think this is a good time for us to stop playing through the game. We've gone through half of the game, and we've seen quite a bit of escalation as we've built out our civilizations. And in fact, most of the map has also been explored with just this tile over here still face down. Now, obviously, I've covered most of the main mechanics to this game, but I've not gone through the details of many of these different advances, and I've tried to focus on giving you a good overall feel for what this game is like. In particular, with the monumental edition of Clash of Cultures, there's quite a bit of extra units, structures that you can build, as well as events and mechanics, and I've tried to touch on all of those things as well. So, the tutorial has now come to a close, and I hope you've enjoyed learning how to play Clash of Cultures along with the Monumental Edition expansion content. Now, if any part of this game jumped out to you as particularly interesting, as well as if there were any turns where we really should have done something differently, then please comment down below and let me know what you think. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.